Tanya Fissa Live is proudly brought to you by Godina. Passion every season. Wonder for the love of gardening. And TanyaFissa.com for all your gardening goodies and supplies. Good morning, everybody. My golly gosh, is it cooking hot or what? Uh, this morning, I was on my way up from Blackwood, um, our lovely favorite garden center down the road. And let me tell you folks, you know that little temperature gauge in the bucky was telling me it was 36 and that was at half past eight this morning. So, I hope you are hydrated. And if you are gonna go out into the garden today, you're only going to go out much later. Much, much later. So now you're gonna plan. Um, I've got some beautiful perennials and listen, uh, you know we change in gardening. We, we uh, Our lives, and as we go through different stages of our lives, so our gardening style changes. And mine has really changed mainly. My main focus in the garden are true perennials, true stalwarts, the ones that I can buy three of, and by next season I've got 9, 10, 12, 15, 21 that I can divide and make more of because that is what smart gardening is about and today I'm going to be sharing those with you but before we get going I have to tell you a few little stories and then I'm going to get to see who's on there today um, yeah I know it's really hot guys but you got to bear with me just just you got to sit there and hang tent so I spent the most beautiful weekend in the wild wild coast the Transkei wild coast and um, man phew, uh, the wildflowers I spent more time on my knees um, taking pictures of these beautiful flowers um, in areas that had been burnt um, and then just the, the surgence of, of beautiful nature just popping through the most amazing 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 bulbs that just come through Little scillas, scillas. I've never seen a green eucomus growing in the wild. And I saw it. I saw it growing right, right there in the wild, um, which was just fantastic. Beautiful streams that you could drink out of. Um, I saw gasterias, guys, gasterias. Uh, you, you know, like that succulent with the long, got like octopus. I saw gasterias hanging like in clusters of grapes, just clusters of grapes from from the rock faces. Um, it, it was most inspiring and uh, completely mind-blowing, absolutely mind-blowing. So there was loads of fresh air and there was loads of fishing, fishing, fishing. The weather was just perfect. Um, and the list in terms of, of, of activities that make me the happiest, it's gardening, fishing, gardening, fishing, gardening, fishing, and you can just throw those to me at any time. And number three would be chop and dop with good friends. So, um, so, so yeah, it was fishing, fishing, fishing. But I got to show you, I got some war wounds. So, so, and today I'm in my gardening gear, guys, because I'm very chilled. But here's my war wound, Mason. Show them what happened. And that was because I was climbing. No, I didn't fall down a rock. I fell up a rock. Yeah, yeah. How do you fall up a rock? Well, Dorothy here yeah, fell up the rock because <laughs> I was too excited to get back to the bait station um, because I just had a bite and all my bait was gone. Yeah, I feed the fish a lot, but that's because I do love them. I feed the fish a lot. So I was climbing up the rock to get over to wherever and I fell up the rock and grazed myself. But anyway, I'm in a very relaxed mode. I'm in my gardening shirt today. Here we go, Mason. Show them my gardening shirt. Can you see? It's got holes. It's torn. Um, but I'm pretty chill today, so guys, um, I, I'm, I'm very excited uh, about what we've got lined up. And, uh, and uh, yeah, I can just say that my heart is full, my soul is full of beautiful plants um, that I got to experience with beautiful people and, and really what a, what a privilege it was, um, an absolute, absolute privilege. Um, and... I think it's that thing about lockdown that many of us have been a bit too scared to travel. And so find the far-flung places. Find those places that are not so busy and commercial because you walk on a beach and there is no one. It's, it's you and the beach. Oh, and we took the fur kids. Ah, oh, we took the fur kids. So uh, Amy and Gracie and Mr. Rolo. Well, Rolo kind of found his rock feet. He was like a rock rabbit. I think there's Dussy in that mixture of that chocolate Yorkie, actually. Um, they went on a canoe 
Um, Gracie faked a leg injury. Um, and Gracie faked a leg injury and then Isolde had to carry her six kilometers up a ravine. True story. And then when we got back um, to where we were, well, can you believe it? The shoulder was healed and it ran miraculously on the beach. I, I tell you, she had us wrapped, wrapped. But anyway, guys, let's see who's here this morning. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, Yashmil, um, yes, talking perennials. Okay, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Judy, good morning. Um, Andre, Dave, good morning. Good morning. Um, Wayne Caldwell, I need to come fishing with you. Yes, you do. Man, pff, don't get me going. We could be starting a fishing show soon. Um, yeah, true story. <laughs> Um, Mad Madison, Maddie, hello, good to have you with us. Andre, good morning. Um, <laughs> Michael, ouch. No, it was, but listen now, you know, so I've got this leg injury now, okay, and the blood's pouring from it, okay, but now, now the other half of the, of the clan are sitting there and watching. Now, of course, they're going to say, oh, is it really that bad? Shall we go home? I'm like, no, 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 of course it's not sore. It's not sore at all. Meantime, I'm like, you know, you're holding it. You're just holding it in because you've got to carry on fishing. Anyway, anyway. Um, Audrey, good morning. 34 degrees in Durban with probably 229% humidity. Yes, hello, hello, hello. Um, Mareki, good morning. Terry Smith, good morning. Um, who else have we got here? Um, Jill, good morning. Maureen Francis, hello, hello. Is this the last time on a Thursday? What? No. No, 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 we're here, we're here, don't worry, we're not going anywhere. Um, Cloudy and Warm and George, Sue, Galvin, Anthony, Michael Petch, Wendy, good morning, Wins, Viz Govender. Uh, yeah, hot Durban, yeah, I hear you. And I saw someone was from Australia. Um, yeah, someone was from the Gold Coast was on here this morning. Where are they? Johan from Valcom. Yo, it must be hot and dry there. Sivy Pele, good morning. Um, Linda, good morning from Pretoria. Uh, let's go to this page here. Let's go to this page. Um, okay, there, it's taking a little bit. Um, Janine from Waterfall. Diane, good morning. Um, Vitbunk, very, very dry and very hot. Um, Diane. Uh, Judy, good morning. Been raining in Cape Town. Oh, yes, the rain's coming here. Tomorrow, tomorrow. Shh, don't say it too loudly. Okay, yes, yes. Renata, good to see you here. Um, Jill's from a hot toti. Um, Tian, Erin, man, um, beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. So welcome, everybody. Yeah, you can see I'm already sweating, um, but that's okay. Uh, we are going to crack on. So, guys, what I need to tell you is that we've got to invest in the plants that work for us. And, and that is what is really, really, really important. The plants that work for us. Um, and that is also according to your climate. Okay, so, so there are various factors we need to think about. We need to think about the wind. If you're living in PE, um, if you're living um, hood spray area where it's hot and dry, we've got to think of what plants will perform best in the area that we live. And we're going to go through a whole lot of plants today to give you some tips on how to choose them, what to choose them, uh, what to choose and how to look after them. So I want to start off with a plant that many of you are scared of, many, many of you are, are, are incredibly nervous of, but guys, there is no need to, to be scared of this. Um, this is the most beautiful, beautiful perennial. Look at it, look at it. Well, maybe I should actually start off by telling you what a perennial is. So a perennial is a plant that will grow for more than one or two seasons. Okay, so an annual is one season. Those are the ones that you buy in the little punnets or that you sow. Okay, they will grow, flower, seed, die in one season. Okay, a perennial is one that will go on and on and on. By means of keeping it alive, there are various things that we need to do, whether it's pruning, whether it's dividing, whether it's taking cuttings to encourage the longevity. Because perennials are normally quick growing. Ah, there's the word we're looking for, quick growing. So if you've got spaces in the garden that you need to fill, like big holes, the easiest way to fill them is by popping in a good fast growing perennial. Yes, because within three months, boof, space is covered. 
fantastic. When I say near instant results, I truly mean near instant results because that is one of your quickest ways to really get your garden looking the part match to the season. Okay, so let's start with this fuchsia. Now guys, don't be scared of fuchsias. This fuchsia is probably one of the most famous fuchsias in the world. It's called Sun Dancer. It's a, a plant that's been brought into our beautiful country by Keith Kirsten. Um, it's not that expensive, guys, at your local garden center. Please, Sun Dancer is, reminds me of that original, original little fuchsia that we used to have. Come really in close here, Mason. I want to show them this, this beautiful, there, 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 there. Look at that little cuppy. Um, a, a fuchsia that many of us, and maybe our grannies used to have it, called Tom Thumb. Tom Thumb was, you, you remember Tom Thumb. It looked similar to this, except it had a much smaller little flower. Much smaller flower and was profuse in flowering. Profuse, profuse. Remember, fuchsias can grow in semi-shade, they can grow in dappled light, early morning sun, up till about 10, but after that, they want shade. No hot, hot afternoon sun. But this guy, folks, is insane. We've got one planted at the bottom of the garden, just here underneath an indigenous tree, lets through some dappled light, and it's just fab. It, it, it goes, it goes, it goes. Remember, if it is getting and sending out some tall shoots like this, okay, if you're getting a bit worried, you see, it's getting a bit out of control. Shame, even this fuchsia is battling a bit in this heat. But the good news is that they perk up. If it starts getting a bit scraggly at the top here and not as neat as you would prefer to be, then just take your thumb and forefinger, okay, grab it there by its next set of leaves, and all you're going to do is pinch it out. That's called pinching. It's pinching out the growth point, okay? What's going to happen now is these little guys that are here, see those little guys, those beautiful little leaves there, they are going to start pushing out and making the plant thicken up really nicely. So once again, let me show you. Come in here. Come in really, really close in there, Mace. Come very, very close in here. Let's see. I'm holding it there. Thumb and forefinger just above that next set of leaves, and it's soft growth, so you simply just pinch it out like that, okay? Nice and easy, nice and easy. So that's a fuchsia, also known in some parts of the world as a fuchsia. Nia, this near fuchsia, nia. it's a fuchsia or a fuchsia. How's your fuchsia doing? Well, last time I looked, she was fine. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> oh gosh, I'm gonna, it's going to be wild today, guys. Mm. Okay, another one that I want to show you. Now, that was that was shade loving, and I want to go with another perennial that's shade loving, if I can stretch across here. Okay, is this little baby over here. Now, this is part of the, the begonia family, and folks, begonias have gone through amazing transformation in terms of their breeding. Yes, the tall cane-like begonias are still fantastic, but this little smart chap here is called begonia baby wings white. Okay, but it's got a little bit of pink in it, just a little bit of pink. Now, begonia baby wings, I've got it growing in areas that get a full morning sun, in areas that just get dappled shade. If it gets dappled shade, it's going to get a bit taller. If it's in more sun, it's going to be more compact with smaller leaves. More shade, broader leaves, slightly taller, but it still will flower. It will flower. And the great thing is about begonias, Near the caravan in the garden, underneath a beautiful yellowwood tree, we've got begonias now probably going on for their fourth season. In fact, I moved them from another part of the garden, transplanted them, stuck them in there, pruned them back hard, gave them a good feeding of compost, and we gave them a bit of plant food, some nice wonder soul, okay? And this just made them grow. Okay, so in order to give lots of flowers, in order to perform, you've got to give them some food. Oh, and there's a motorbike coming up the driveway. Someone should shoot it. I wonder if anybody can shoot. Can you, can you, Marcelo, can you shoot it with the paintball gun? Yes, I'm just giving Marcelo some instructions to get rid of the motorbike. Um, <laughs> he's gonna really think I've gone mad. Okay, so there is semi-shade, guys. Begonias, and, and you get the, um, 
the baby wings pink, which is also beautiful. Um, and I've actually just got a bit of a hodgepodge of them in, in the garden near the caravan. And uh, they truly are magnificent. If you are in a frosted area, so if you re receive frost during the winter months, you can give it a light pruning and cover it with some bark. Cover the entire plant with some bark, all right? So that's light bark, like a light compost. Cover it, let it see its way through the winter. Okay, let it see its way through the winter and believe it or not, in the spring, it'll shoot through again because you've protected it with that lovely little um, microclimate that you've created. Almost like putting a little electric blanket on it. Okay, another stalwart over here. Oh, is this beautiful guy. Now, folks, if you followers and if you buy the Gardener magazine, um, you will know that this plant is a firm favorite of ours. Um, it's called Salvia lutea. You get, um, Salvia lucantha, I beg your pardon. You get many different forms of this. Now, this is the little white. So it's got mauve, okay, and then the white pops out. So you get another one which is white, and this little part of the flower is pink. You get another one that is just pure white. Oh, they're spectacular. But let me tell you, can you kill this plant? Oh, no. You cannot kill this plant. Plant this perennial in the hottest, driest part of your garden. Hottest and driest because it will perform. It will perform. Um, why do we know that? Because it's got grey foliage. It's got grey foliage. Look at the undersides. Beautiful grey foliage. Plus... It's a bit furry. Can you hear them? Okay, a bit furry. So when you've got furriness, when you've got grey foliage, the plant is telling you, I can cope with wind, I can cope with sea air, I can cope with hot, hot, hot weather, because the, the, the little grey, um, uh, the grey hairs actually help to reflect and deflect some of the sunlight. And that's, in fact, what we saw this weekend so prevalent in the plants growing on the wild coast. We saw this plant. Um, we saw this plant here, a beautiful little gazania. This is the common as mud, absolutely common as mud, little gazania. But my goodness, look what it's doing in this bag. It is just sprawling. This little plant will be able to grow to over a meter. That's its spread. Over a meter, guys. Same thing. Gray foliage little hairs, grey foliage, little, little hairs, all right, lots of little flowers. And we saw this plant growing in the felt. We saw it growing right in between the rocks, on the rocks, in the, at the beach, like right there, sea air, sea droplets banging onto it. So in terms of capability and strength and like, like big kahuna plant, that's one of these. So a really, really good perennial. Can even grow right up into South Africa. So right up into the into Josie, Pretoria, all the way up there. Brilliant. Um, anywhere on the coastal regions. Cape Town, brilliant. It will grow. It loves that hot, dryness, sandy soil. Poor soil. Poor soil. It will grow incredibly well. Okay. So that's that guy. I'm going to put him back over here. Um... All right, no, you are actually going to go over here. Um, oh, while we're here, um, can we, can we, can I show everybody this beautiful um, amaryllis? Mason, you're going to have to come right in close here. Um, and look at this, look, look at this beauty. Now, I hope you guys have been doing what we've been showing you in the last few weeks, because if you had brought, bought your amaryllis and planted them, they'd be doing this. This is called Harlequin. Um, guys, they're spectacular. They're still available online, um, the red. You can still get them at your local garden center. So please go and buy them and plant them. It's not too late. It really, really isn't too late um, to buy them and plant them because they will still flower for you and look completely spectacular. Okay, all right, all right, moving along, moving along, moving along, moving along. Now, I want to show you this plant. Now, I've left all the all the, the dead leaves on it because I want to show you quick tidy up. How do you look after perennials to keep them looking good? And this has to be one of my most favorite um, Guys, this is an agapanthus. Um, yeah, believe it or not, it's an agapanthus. I don't grow it for its flower. It does get a flower. It gets a beautiful pale blue flower on a long spike. Beautiful, big head. Um, but 
I personally, I grow it entirely for its foliage because I know through the winter, through the summer, when they even should be flowering, into autumn, I know that I'm going to be blessed with this constant beautiful color. Agapanthus are indigenous, they are a bulbous plant, so they divide, and as a perennial, you would divide this by means of division, which we've showed you in a previous live, okay? So remember, if you want to know how to do that, go back and search on, on how to make divisions, um, because we showed you that, and it's dead easy, but I love this plant. In the garden, just in front of me, uh, just in front of me, we've got Agapanthus Zambezi, the foxies are still going on. So as a nice group, as a mass plant, it's spectacular. But to keep them looking good and to stop them expending energy into leaves that they really shouldn't. Um, some, you can just go around them and actually you can just start pulling off these dead bits. It's important that you do that, okay? If they're a bit more difficult, get a sharp pair of secateurs and clean them off. I'll turn this around here. Um, and it's important that you do that because... You know, when you're leaving leaves like this, okay, now these leaves can go straight onto the compost heap. When you're leaving leaves like this hanging about, when you leave them like that hanging about, okay, on the plant, and say we have three or four days of rain, this is the ideal breeding ground for fungal, fungal infections, the cocos that we don't want, okay. So keep your plants neat and tidy. And by doing that, that's removing any of your lower spent foliage. That's the first one. First thing that I want you to pay attention to. Um, and even some lower ones, you can just remove them. And, and we do this weekly in the garden. Um, we do it weekly so that we can just keep the plants looking good, stress-free, um, and make sure that they are okay. Um, and this is Zambezi, guys. I, I urge you. And they are a bit on the dear side. But like I said, when you invest in perennials, folks, you buy one of these. And look carefully. There's one, two, three, four, five, five, five plants. Five plants here. Okay, so don't divide it immediately. Buy the plant, put it in the garden, enjoy it for the season. Autumn. Autumn is when you divide agapanthus. Okay, autumn. When the temperatures start cooling, once it's finished flowering, okay, that's when you would divide it. Um, and then divide it, and then you've got more. Okay, so kind of that's the cycle. That's the cycle of life that we go through. Right, two more I want to show you here. Um, a little Felicia. Now, this is more of a ground cover, um, but also actually a true perennial. Um, Felicia, or Felicia as you call them. Um, also, when you feel its foliage. Hold on, I want to see if you can hear this. Can you hear? It's like scratchy. It's almost got like little hairs, little spiky hairs on the underside of its leaf. Really, almost like a um, ooh, when you when you touch a um, when you touch a frog. Oh, hate frogs. Um, you can hear that. It's uh, it's very scratchy. So what is it telling you? It's telling you the same things I told you about the grey. It's got little um, little indentations um, on top of the leaf, which helps to deflect wind. It helps to protect it. Um, which means that it's a really tough customer, okay? A very, very tough customer. Now, this is actually going to be a perfect plant to show you a bit of treatment. So, Felicia, let's talk about it quickly. Full sun. Um, give it space to grow. Beautiful spring, summer flowering right through into the autumn. Um, I mean, just look at that. That blue, that sky blue is a sky blue with that little yellow dot in the center. It's just too new. -new. And uh, the best is when there's a bit of wind. Oh, look. Oh, it's spectacular. I love it. And in fact, um, yeah, we saw some Felicias growing there as well. Um, and, you know, I think what, what is always the most um, rewarding and, 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 and completely soul food for me is that you can see um, where plants come from. So yes, a Felicia has been taken, it's gone through a bit of, of processing, so they found the better plant and that plant they've made cuttings of and reproduced. But the original form still lives there out in the wild. Um, and it grows out there out in the wild in all those extreme conditions. And 
That's why I always say to you, when thinking about putting a plant in your garden, ask yourself the question, from whence does it come? Where does this plant originate from? Because that gives you a very fine idea on how it's going to do in your garden. So, let's get to some other maintenance. <clears throat> Excuse me. So we spoke about removing the bottom leaves, okay? That was of your Ag Aggie's panties. My grandma, grandmother used to call them, not, not Agapanthus, my Aggie's panties. Aggie's panties. Oh, my goodness. Okay, I, okay, I've been given instruction to go to the queue. But before I do that, I'm going to show you how to deadhead these. Now, this is a standard rule with any of your perennials. Remember, we showed you, we showed you nipping. Now we're going to go to deadheading. So this is finished flowering. Follow it down, follow it down to where it joins the plant, where you have got your first set of leaves. There's your first set of leaves and just nip it off, okay? Gone. Let's find another one. This one should be easier to see. Take it, follow it, follow it down. There's your leaf. There's the leaf right there and just nip it off. The more you do that, the more it's going to flower because instead of all the energy going into seeds, yes, we might want one or two seeds, okay? But you can leave those seed heads, you can protect those. Unless you want that, then I would deadhead, because the more you deadhead, the more you're going to encourage good flowering. Okay, let me get to the queue, um, because my tech team is going to, they, they're coming out and they are shouting at me, shouting, shout, can you believe it? Okay, Lynn wants to know, please can you advise what is eating the stem of, ooh, 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 ooh. okay, what is eating the stem of my agapanthus, eating and rotting from the inside of the stem out? Oh, Lynn, okay, Lynn, you have got the agapanthus worm or the amaryllis worm, they call it the clivia worm, it is a pest. It comes out at this time of the year when there's beautiful hot temperatures. Uh, so the little moth comes along and it lays its eggs over here on the leaves of the agapanthus and then they hatch and they need to eat. So then they start burrowing into the plant and sometimes you can actually see them in the leaf. You can actually see those caterpillars. It's so gross. It's so gross. Um, but a great thing to do is if you do see them, just squash them. Squash them, squash them, squash them. Okay. How, and it, that's a lot of fun. Yeah, that's a lot of fun. But anyway, we won't talk about that. Um, but Lynn, what's happened in your case is that the, the, the caterpillar has now made its way down to the bulb because that's where they want to get to. That's where all the nourishment is. That is where the best part of the plant is. It's like an artichoke, heart. That's the best part of the artichoke. So it's making its way down and it is eating away at the core of your plant. And then what you see in there is the snottiness. It's like a snotty, gooey mold. It's the only way I can describe it. Think of a two-year-old with a runny nose. Oh, do we have to? Yes. Think of a two-year-old with a runny nose over here, you know, and it's that snot. That is what you see. And you see that in your clivias. You see that in your agapanthus. You see it in a lot of your fleshy perennials. So what do you use? Guys, I want you to use this. Uh, it's called Lava Pro. Um, Lynn, I want you to use this, please. It's very, very safe. Um, you're going to take a sachet. You're going to dilute a sachet into one liter of water. Okay, oh, wrong way around, there it is. A sachet into one liter of water and you're gonna spray it on your agapanthus, okay? What happens is when the caterpillars eat anywhere that you have sprayed this, they get a really bad tummy ache, okay? They get a really bad tummy ache. They kind of get diarrhea, you know, they do. They get diarrhea and then they die. However, the good thing is that if a bird has to come along and eat it, if a um, ladybird was there where you sprayed, it's not going to affect it at all. If there was um, a dragonfly cruising about, like looking for his, his, his babe, nothing's going to happen to it. Um, and if your dog eats the dead caterpillar, nothing's going to happen to it either. So Lava Pro, guys, go along to your local garden center, um, go along to builders and you'll find it. Please use it. Um, Another option is to use uh, Margaret Roberts Organic Insecticide. That will also do it, folks. Um, but please look out. And especially now, pay attention, pay attention to, to your plants. 30 minutes, you've got to be kidding me. Um, 30 minutes, I don't know where's this lot coming from, this tech crew, I think they're in another time zone. Okay, Simone says, how do I divide that salvia that you had to transplant in another section of the garden? 
No, okay, that wasn't a salvia, um, Simon. That was the, that was the, um, that was the begonia. So, Simon, that was the begonia that I transplanted into another section of the garden. And when you transplant, always remove half of the foliage to stop the plant from stressing. So, so what I want you to do, if you are going to transplant, remove half the foliage. You can't leave it all there because you're going to stress this plant out too much. So, cut it back. Then prepare your planting hole really well, okay? I would suggest that you feed it with some kind of plant food, like this wonder all-purpose. It's got cytokinins, it's got gibberellins in it. It's got um, all sorts of plant, um, plant auxins is what we call them. It's also got some molybdenum, um, it's got some nitrogen, some phosphorus in it, some calcium in it. And what this is, it's 20 mils into one liter of water. It's a mixture of an organic plus an inorganic. So you're getting the kelp. This is based, the base of this is kelp. So we know that with kelp, when you're feeding the plant, you're getting lots of strength. Okay, so whether you are pouring it on top of the plant and around the plant, when pouring it on top, it's you're going to be foliar feeding. So the leaves will actually absorb some of this beautiful stuff. All right. And then around the plant. And what that does is when your plants are going through stress, guys, when they're going through stress, please, I would recommend that you do feed them before you're doing anything. Um, and, and that is important. Also, what can you use this on? You can use it on annuals. You can use it on trees. You can use it on lawns as a good plant tonic, as a plant food. Um, oh, how do you transplant the leucantha? Right, thank you. Oh, how do you transplant it? Right, I got you. Anyway, use the plant food. Um, it really works well for anything, even your indoor pot plants. Okay, even your indoor pot plants. Okay, how do you transplant the salvia leucantha? Okay, let me show you very, very quickly. What I want you to do is take the plant, prune it by half. Just the same what I've told. Prune it by half. Be ruthless. Cut it back. Dig around the plant. Okay, try and keep as much of the root ball as possible onto the plant, as much as the root ball. Have your hole prepared where you are going to be putting it and put in a good amount of compost, handful of Atlantic Bio Ocean, okay, into the planting hole. Pop your little baby in and give it a really good watering. Then what I would suggest that you do, and by the way, only do this, not on a day like today, do this on a very cool day or like late this afternoon. And then you can give it a bit of this beautiful all-purpose wonder soul, which is what? What is this? Ah, yes, yes. What did, what did I say it was? Yes, it's a little stimulant. And it helps plants when they're going through stress. Okay, so, so you get it. So give it some of that. And in no time at all, this is going to shoot through and um, it's going to be as happy as Larry. Okay, right. Moving these things out of the way here. <coughs> Joan wants to know, will Bulbanella tolerate semi-shade? Yes. Yes, yes, it will. In fact, all that you'll find is, remember I spoke to you about the begonia. I said its leaves will get slightly broader and it might get slightly taller, but it actually will. Um, we've got some bulbanella growing under dappled shade um, in this section, in the front of the garden here, and it's actually doing perfectly well, so absolutely. Um, Yashmir wants to know, what perennial can I use that is tall flowers in full sun along the driveway Preferably a plant that flowers throughout November to January. Ah, okay. Yashmir, for this, I'm going to want you to watch a quick, quick YouTube clip on two perennials that I'm not going to be talking about today. Um, and both of them are going to do the job for you. And I have got one that I will show you afterwards. So watch this. This is all about perennials, folks. And it is going to add just maybe a little bit of an English country look to your garden. So if you've got a garden that's full of beautiful colour, literally moving through the seasons, one pops up, one disappears, how do you maintain that and how do you look after it? Well, it's this that is most important. Your secateurs are your biggest, biggest ally in a garden like this. And in order to keep it going and that longevity, you really need to use these guys. So make sure they're close at hand whenever you whip out into the garden so that you don't have to go digging and looking for them. Always know where they are. And remember, only you use them. One secateur, one person. So let's take a look at this penstemon. 
perfect plant for whether you live right down on the coast or up where it gets really, really cold, and I mean snow, this plant will survive. They die down, they come back during the spring and right through into the summer. During the summer, how do we make sure that they carry on? You can already see that shoots are beginning to push through from the previous. This was the first set of flowers. All right, coming up, you can see they're almost going over. This one is gone already. And here the new spike has been pushed up. But to encourage that, encourage more spiking, what do we do? And it's all about deadheading, folks. And it's so critical and it's something that us gardeners tend to be a little bit lazy about. And if we had to simply do this, follow this dead bit down. You can see this is where it's now gonna start forming the seed capsules. We don't want seed capsules. We want more flowers. So you follow it all the way down to literally where it emerges from the plant and literally just cut it off. That's what we want. The more we do that, the more we are going to encourage this new growth to start pushing through. When we do that, of course, after new growth comes beautiful flowers. Really, really important. So get those secateurs out, wander through your garden and see what you can prune and deadhead and get going again. There's nothing quite like having colour right throughout the summer. We all know our spring gardens are a pow, like an explosion. Literally fireworks all over. But then what happens after that? when we get 34 degree days, when the sun is beating down and we're looking for some color in our gardens. Well, one way to guarantee that you're gonna be getting it is to plant some of these babies. Just look at the color. I mean, they are probably the most common plant that you will ever, ever find. People have been using them for centuries in their gardens and there's no reason why you shouldn't be planting them as well in your garden. Whether you've got a one acre garden or literally a garden this big as a postage stamp. These are beautiful Argyranthemums or the common daisy. They're pinks, they're yellows, they're whites, they're even doubles. And you get the most amazing colors these days with the new hybrids that are nice and compact, double flowers, something for everyone. Whether you choose to put them in pots or whether they're going to be in the garden. The most important thing is to remove the dead heads because that keeps them flowering. So if you're not a daisy person, well, what else is there to use? This is one of my favorites. Look at this beautiful baby. This is an aquilegia. Aquilegias are brilliant. Once again, from the coast, right up until where it's very, very cold. You can buy them in little trays from your local garden center or in single pots like this if you're looking for a bit of a more instant effect, you know, as instant gratification people. Aquilegias come in pinks, purples, even bicolors. They can grow in semi-shade in the really, really hot areas or even in full sun just not very, very deep shade. Um, but for me, they epitomize a beautiful country garden. I love them because they're so forgiving and it's a true perennial. They just keep going and keep going and keep going. So put one or two of these in your garden and be rewarded equally as so. Right, Jashmir, so I hope that gives you an idea when you're looking at daisies, which we spoke about there, I mean, they, they're incredibly good. They, they just give you that color that you're wanting. And just as a quick on the side, this is your most commonest, commonest yellow daisy. You can see it's quite tall, um, beautiful little flowers. Um, I'm going to show you another compact variety. But if you're looking for plants that really just give you some vuma, uh, that is definitely one to go for. And also consider the salvias, which I'm going to touch on in a minute or two, and that will give you some advice. But before we get going on that, you know I love gadgets. I love, love gadgets. So um, forgive me, but this is my contraption that I made this morning um, because I couldn't quite bring the tap here, you, you know, onto the veranda. Um, so I made this little contraption, and uh, what I want to show you is this little guy over here. Now, this is a water flow smart meter, a water, smo water flow smart meter, or a smart flow water meter. Either way is it tracks what you're doing. Now, we all know how quickly we can go through water. And just think of when that day zero was coming in Cape Town. Just, just think about that. I mean, they would say you were down to, what, 12 liters or 20 liters a day. I mean, something stupid. And you couldn't believe how quickly you used it. And likewise, that's exactly in the garden. And we use this guy a lot. And we use it 
even from our water tanks, because, because you've got a water tank, doesn't mean to say that, oh, oh, the water is going to be endless. So we track it in different areas of the garden by how many liters we are applying. Because time is one thing, measuring it, but it also depends on the pressure that you've got. Um, and that differs from your municipal to municipal area, but it also depends on the pressure that's coming out of the little pump that you might have that's pumping from your Jojo or your eco tank. Do you know what I mean? Okay, so what I want to show you is this guy. It's a little water smart flow meter. I always get the name wrong, but never mind. You know what it does. You just attach it. It's really simple. Let me show you over here. So it just clicks onto your tap. Um, so there's your little guy. It just clicks on. It operates on a battery, which is one of those little flat batteries, nice and easy to change. Um, and then look here at the little screen. At the screen, there, you. This is on auto. So this is if you just you're just going to run it. Okay, okay there. And then there is your liters per minute. It'll tell you how many liters per minute that you are going through. Fascinating stuff. Remember, because it's all based on pressure. This will tell you on your first round. You see, total one, 10.4 liters. Ha. Huh. 10.4 liters and I was just practicing with it second round total so you if you want to clear that then so you can run um, different stations if I want to clear that you hold that down for two seconds there we go it's back to naught nice and easy really nice and easy so I want to show you how this little guy works because it's fascinating you can control exactly the amount and and I say this and I'm not being anal about this guys I, I really am not I mean we've got 20,000 liters of water storage on this property and it goes in a flash. In fact, the tanks are dry at the moment. I'm praying for the rain tomorrow um, so that we can then have the rain. Tanks are full again. I can then attach this guy literally onto, so it wouldn't get attached onto here. It would get attached onto the little Gardena um, clipping. Um, on that Gardena clip and then away it goes. But onto your tap, even better. So watch here. All we're going to do is we're going to attach this. So this is our hose pipe. So we clip that on there. Okay, now we're going to, we're going to, where's, where's the end of it? Oh, here we go, here we go. Okay, Max, turn this tap on for me, please. Mason, you, you stay there and watch this thing. So, um, are we on, Megs? Yeah. Right, we've got power. I'm going to turn my tap on. Gosh, this is the, the, the tap installed by the non-plumber. That's me. Okay. Um, Turn that baby on. Alrighty. Turn your tap, turn that tap on. Right, and you can see, watch, it'll start clicking through. There we go. Are we clicking through there? There we go. Look at that. Look at that. Quickly, 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 we're going up. The liters are just clicking through, clicking through. So it's important. And look at this. Oh, Mason, out here in the garden. Spray it, baby, spray it. And if I could run under this water right now, I would actually run underneath here and go and have a little shower myself. But, um, okay, we can turn that tap off there. Let me turn this guy off over here. But more importantly, that was about five seconds. Five seconds. And I've used five liters of water. Scary, hey? Scary. Okay. So it's about how are we, how are we watering? start watering only when you are in the garden and that's why using one of these guys uh, i tell you uh, i've used many many i've tried out many and 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 this is gospel, gospel truth i've tried out so many of these spray nozzles um and this is the one for me that does the job this one why because it's got a trigger so i can control it okay and it got it goes from low to high pressure and i can go from a direct so if I want to kind of spray the paving with something, to a fan shape over there. This is my go-to baby. Um, but anyway, we're not talking about that today. I want you to pay attention to water usage. Um, only spray, start spraying when you are at the plants. Water early in the morning and late in the afternoon, not during the heat of the day. Um, and conserve, conserve, conserve. And guys, if you've got gutters and you don't have a tank, please put an order in for a tank or just give yourself a birthday present. But anyway, let's get back to the perennials. Um, Mason, I want to show the folks these beautiful perennials here. Now, these are spectacular. 
this over here, these are dianthus. These are the Jolt series. I mean, look at them. They're actually nice and tall. And look at this. Look at this arrangement here. So we've got beautiful Jolt. And um, this is a dianthus that once it's finished flowering, guys, remember, all you're going to do is exactly the same. Let me get my secateurs. Um, all you're going to do, stay there, is exactly the same. If this was finished flowering, you're going to go back to that leaf. Okay? The first set of leaves where there are no flowers, follow it down to the set of leaves and then just cut it off. Because look, look what's coming there already. See? They're the new flowers. But if we don't cut this off, this is going to start making seeds and wada 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 and not giving you enough energy into there. So please do that. Okay. So these are dianthus. You'll find them at your local garden center right now. Um, and they're spectacular to use in little gaps and just to bring a bit of that splash of summer color. I love this plant. This is called Shasta Daisy. I remember Shasta Daisies. And look at the size of that flower. Uh, this is called Daisy May. Um, Daisy May is a brilliant Shasta Daisy. Um, gets nice and tall, but also quite compact, so it doesn't fall over. Um, you can divide this very easily at the end of summer, lift it up, divide it, compost your soil well, and then pop it back into the ground. Um, this is the compact daisy that I was telling you about. Remember we saw the tall yellow one, but now look how compact this guy is. So for the front of borders, front of beds, this is where you would opt for this. Whereas that tall yellow that I showed you, more towards the back of the bed. Okay, Mace, let's go to these beautiful little ulstrum areas. Now we've shown you some inca lilies before, but guys, as a perennial, that's going to give you bang for your buck. You cannot go wrong with these. Um, this variety, they are called Inchaka. Okay, that's what you want to look out for. Inchaka or the princess variety. Okay, um, and look at this color. But I mean, look at this color. Look at this mauve. I mean, this is like a gentian's violet mauve. Remember gentian's violet? My word, I was, it was put all over me as a child. Um, gentian's violet, it looks like that beautiful red. And at the moment, in, in our garden, if you had seen one of the clips that I put on Facebook, where they are just a massive color. They're tough because they've got a bulb. They're really hardy. They go on forever. Um, and when they start looking a bit scraggly, you know, a little bit scraggly, remember with an inca lily, folks, you don't cut it with the secateurs. If this had finished flowering, you grab it, grab it, and I'm going to grab the pot, and you just, one, two, pull it. Okay, and now it's broken off from the bulb. See, it's broken off from the bulb. You've taken away the stem that's looking a bit manky, all right, and now it's going to push through new shoots, new foliage, new growth off the bulbs. Okay, so never prune an ulstromeria. Always just grab the foliage and give it a yank. All right. So, in the back of the bed, over here, the back of the bed, the back of the chair, <laughs> the back of the chair, are my goras. Um, guys, plant goras. As a perennial, it is tried and tested. It's also known as the butterfly plant. Why? Because when the breeze blows, when there's a bit of it in the wind, it is spectacular. Um, the new varieties are not so... Um, are not so invasive. When I say invasive, because they can take over. The new varieties are much more compact and much more controlled. Um, you really don't have to be that aggressive in your pruning with them because they are more compact, which is quite a good thing because I've had to pull out goras at some point in the garden. So if your gora gets out of control, give it a good haircut. And I mean a good haircut. At least halfway down, you can even go a little bit more. Um, because then they will come away again. Yes, it'll sulk for a little bit, but that's also okay. Okay, Mace, I want you to step over to your right, because I'm going to go down here, and I want to show you these bad boys. Um, folks, these are some of the other perennials. Now, this is the, the pink gora. Um, this is the pink gora. Uh, so I just showed you the white. And this one over here is called Beliza. Beliza, dark pink. Um, you will find these guys, and they are beautiful. The pink is darker than the normal, the normal common pink that we've seen before. It's a much darker pink, much more compact plant. You can see it. Oh, look. And when the wind blows, here we go. That's why it's called the butterfly plant. Uh, really spectacular. Irrigeron. Talk about a daisy-like plant that you will never kill. Use irrigeron. Um, it's a beautiful little daisy as a ground cover. It's actually a true perennial. Um, it'll grow anywhere. Hot, sunny, banks. 
Um, it's fantastic, an absolute plant. But um, I was talking about some of the other salvias, and I quickly want to show you these over here. So this is a dwarf. This is a gregia. This is a dwarf gregia, but look at that color, guys. Just look at that insane color. I love using gregias next to daisy bushes with some erigeron in the front. They ball shaped, nice, rounded, and compact. Love the sun, and the sunbirds go mad. But, you know, I don't really like the Australians, but I'm going to give them this one because um, this plant has currently been marketed in Australia as the best, the best plant to attract, um, uh, what do they call those things? Nectar feeders. Pollinators. Yeah, what are they called? Pollinators. Pollinators. Yes, that's it. So this is the number one plant. This is a salvia called Red Roman. And they say, you plant this in your garden and they will come. They will come. Um, it's, it's a beautiful perennial. I've just planted some in the garden. Um, they haven't yet come into flower like this guy, but I'm very, very excited about it. But all salvias, whether it's a salmia like this one, whether it's this red Roman, which has got, sits, where the flower sits slightly prouder, all right, on the stem, or whether it's this little blue salvia here, which is called mystique, which is more compact, also sits nice and proud, but just spectacular. Guys, you can't go wrong. You really cannot go wrong. And then for what do you put in the front? Man, come on, look at this baby. Come on. And this is little Stachys Byzantia. Um, it used, it's also known as lamb's ears because when you, when you touch it, it it's soft and, 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 and cuddly. And this is the beautiful lamb's ears. We're seeing all the same things, okay? We're seeing all the same things because it's got gray, it's got some hairs, okay? It's telling us all those good points that we learned about just now. And plus you can't help but want to touch it. Oh, it's so nice. It's so nice. Lamb's ears. Teach your kids about them. It really is cool. So, so that is, it's a, it really is stalwart. Now you'll notice here on this one that it's starting to push flowers. Okay, see here? He has this little mo flowers. Now, there are various thoughts about treating your stachys at this point. I don't like letting mine flower. I don't like letting the stachys flower because then what I find is that it starts losing quality. It makes sense of all this lower foliage. So I remove the flowers. I remove the flower spikes before they open because the plant is putting all its energy into the flowers and I actually grow this plant just for its foliage because the contrast against salvias, I mean, just look at that. Isn't that beautiful? Look at the contrast against these salvias. It's spectacular. Or whether it's a little gregia like that. I mean, it's beautiful. So put your lamb's ears in. And once again, it's a true perennial. So you'll be able to lift it up and divide it and, and break it up and plant it into other parts of the garden. So, so just as a word of caution, I cut mine off right at the base. I don't let it flower at all. Um, I really don't because I want it to keep that beautiful foliage right at the bottom. Okay, I'm jumping up. I'm running back that side. Mace, you can hang out here and show them some pretty flowers while I get myself back into my spot. Um, all righty. Um, where's my computer? All right, let's see, guys. Have we got any more questions coming through here? Yes, yes. Um, Alminda, um, what would, could you suggest a perennial that I could use in medium-sized pots on my stoop? Morning shade, afternoon sun. Um, would love to combine it with colorful annuals. Morning shade. Oh, okay, 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 okay. You, you, okay, good spot, good spot, good spot. Now, um, the agapanthus, Zambezi, that I spoke about earlier, use that as your main plant, okay? Use that as your main plant. If you're getting morning sun, um, morning shade, you could also go with a nice little plectranthus. You could also go with that beautiful little compact daisy that I spoke about earlier. So you could put that little compact daisy in there and you could put maybe some blue petunias around it or some blue alisum. That would be a nice combination, actually, yeah. Yeah, I haven't thought about that. Yes, yes, you could do that, most certainly. How much water does a fuchsia need? Kirsten wants to know. Um, what, it's all about your planting and your prep. So, so Kirsten, if you are going to be planting, when you do plant, um, 
your future and most perennials. Remember to use this stuff, the stuff that I talk about all the time, guys. And I talk about it because it works. Um, it truly does work. It's called Hydro Cash. Remember, this is this gel, this beautiful gel. This is just two teaspoons in here. Two little teaspoons in here where water has been added. And I mean, I can add a whole lot more water to this and it's just going to swell and swell and swell. So at the bottom of your planting hold, two or three large handfuls of this beautiful gooey gel. Because what has it done? The gooey gel has absorbed all the water. You've prepared your hole with compost. You've prepared it with one or two handfuls of Atlantic Bio Ocean in the planting hole. And you can even use a handful of bone meal. Yes. Then... You're mixing, mixing that in with your compost. Then you add in two or three big handfuls of your hydro cash. Then you put the plant on top of that. On top of that. And then you fill it in as normally. So that when your plant gets stressed, and if you're not there to give it some water, it just takes the water from the hydro cash. Because it's like its own little Jojo tank by its roots. Ha! Huh. Makes sense. And you know, last week we planted some proteas. It was hot last week. It was a cooker. It was a cooker. We planted some proteas into the garden. We used some hydro cash. And let me tell you, not one of them has done that. Mm. Not one of them. And we haven't watered them since. So they were planted last week, Wednesday. We have not had rain yet. They got watered once. That was it. And they have not had any water yet. And they won't need it. They won't need it because they have been planted with hydro cash. So... Um, a, th a school, a food, what do we call it? Food for thought. Food for thought, guys. Judy, um, a question. What is the best thing to get my fuchsias to flower? I've given 315, but I'm still waiting. Okay. Um, if you gave 315, that's fine. You know, you've used a slow release fertilizer there. Remember, we spoke earlier about this all purpose wonder? Guys, use this, Judy. Please use it because what is it going to do? What did I tell you about earlier? It's full of kelp it's kelp based which has got the auxins the gibberellins the cytokinins all the good plant nutrition it's got the micronutrients in it plus it's got a lot of your other elements which are going to encourage flowering it also works as a little bit of a tonic so you can use it as a spray on your fuchsia so just put it into a little spray bottle so that's 20 mils of the wonder into one liter of water and then just a little spritz pss, 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 onto your fuchsia Okay, so then it absorbs this through the leaves, also wherever it falls, and away you go. Um, and that's really going to help it and encourage your flowering. So think about that. Right, guys, we are nearly at the end of our session. My goodness, I can't believe we actually got through all the plants, guys. Um, remember, folks, that please keep a lookout for our magazines on shelf. Um, the Gardener, hot off the press. Um, it's got a beautiful fuchsia, and we've been talking about fuchsias, guys. Um, and we've got an entire article on the ballerinas of the garden, all the ins and outs, how to look after them, uh, what to look out for. So inside there, you've got fuchsias. We've got herbs for fur kids, um, over 20 herbs and herb remedies um, for fur kids. We've also got summer bulbs, what to plant, and a really special one in there called an ornithogalum. A chinkery chi that you have never seen before. So please go out and get your latest copy of the Gardener Mag or Detainee. And remember, Grow to Eat is still on shelf. If you haven't got your Grow to Eat, you need it. It's all about tea trees, bay leaves, edible hedges. Have you ever believed it? Edible hedges. True story. If you see your husband like on his hands and knees chewing on something, that's because he's eating your edible hedge. <laughs> Anyway, anyway, moving along, guys, uh, a huge thank you to our sponsors, to Wonder and Gardena. Um, a big shout out to you and thank you for your support. Remember, we will answer all the questions um, later this afternoon um, that we haven't got to yet on Facebook. But um, that's it for this week, folks. Um, I hope you are catching um, The Gardener, season 19 on the Home Channel. If you don't know when it is, go to information, go to 176 and scroll right, okay, and it'll tell you when it comes on. All right, uh, or just search, um, yeah, or follow us on Facebook because then we tell you when it is. We tell you exactly when it is. Um, and uh, most importantly, uh, who? It's on ketchup. Oh, it's on ketchup. Yes, oh, yes, we got fancy. Oh, we got Lani. We're Lani now. Um, so it's also on ketchup, and that's the ketchup button that you push on that remote. No, not that remote, that remote, yes. 
that remark, yes. It's on, on catch up. Uh, guys, it's been wonderful spending the last hour with you. Um, thank you for being with me. Uh, look after yourselves. Be safe, as always. Take care of you and yours. And most importantly, happy gardening. Bye-bye. Tanya Fissa Live was proudly brought to you by Gardena. Passion every season. Wonder for the love of gardening. And TanyaFissa.com for all your gardening goodies and supplies.